Hi, everyone. I'm Shelly Lyle. And I'm Brian Avery. And welcome to Voices from the Field, a podcast brought to you by the Department of Sport Management at the University of Florida. This podcast was created to share the career journeys and journeys of sport industry professionals. Our hope is that you learn the ins and outs of different sport industry professions. We are excited to be with all of you this week and with our special guest, Sean Gagnon. Sean is the CEO of the Abs Company and, and the VP of the Knuckles Company. Sean got his bachelor's in exercise science from Trenton State College and his master's in exercise science from the University of Florida. He has worked for the Knuckles Company for about 20 years and the Abs Company for 17. Thanks for being with us, Sean. Yeah, thanks for having me. Always great to speak with fellow Gators. Go yeah. Gators. <laughs> yeah. Go Gators. Um, so tell us, Sean, a little bit about your career journey um, and what drew you into exercise science and the products you've created. Sure. I think like a lot of people get into exercise science. I was an athlete, right? And then I was a I, I was a wrestler my whole life. And then when that ended for me, I looked for a way to just stay around sport. You know, it was just such a big part of my upbringing, my life. And, you know, com competition was over. So how do you stay involved? And I found fitness. You know, I always had a love of fitness. And so I was naturally drawn to that. And when I was an undergrad at Trenton State, the degree is more broad, right? It's exercise science. You get nutrition, phys, and kinesiology and all those things. And I really, when I was there, fell in love with physiology. And I just loved learning how the body worked from the inside. And obviously, in that study, you did a lot of work with things that Dr. Pollock had done. So when I had the opportunity as a graduate student to, to pick a school, and I saw that while he was from the UF, that made it pretty easy for me. So that's how I got to UF, and I really dug in on physiology. Um, and from there, you know, when I was at UF, I was fortunate enough to have two assistantships. One was at Living Well, which really focused for, for to generalize, focused on the preventative side of health and wellness. And I also had an assistantship with Dr. Randy Braith, where we were working with people who had had organ transplants. So we were on the rehabilitative side of things. And some of my internships while I was a student there were on cardiac rehab and pulmonary rehab and things like that. So I had I got to experience both things, preventative and rehabilitation. And I was just in love with prevention. I knew that health and fitness would change people's lives. And don't get me wrong, rehabilitation is, is massively critical and not enough people take advantage of it. But my theory was if we could help people from getting there in the first place, that's where I wanted to spend my life. And that's what I've been doing ever since. That's awesome. And tell us about the companies that you work for right now. Yeah, so I we recently just sold the Knuckles company. So we did that for 20 years. And it was a it was a wellness products company, you know, massage, relaxation, things like that. And we would sell those products all over the world, you know, via the internet and distributors and everything. And that was a great business. But you know, our true love, my true love is fitness. And that's why we got involved with um, the abs company, why we started it. When I left UF. I came to work at a health club company called Exercise here in New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey. And we had five health clubs. And I was very fortunate in the sense that the guy that founded that company was a famous fitness inventor. He invented a product called the Ab Roller. And that was a little device, exercise device, where you would lay on the ground and you would do crunches. And he by no means invented the crunch, but for the first time it was mechanized, right? So you could get on the ground and do it the right way. And what made that product so successful and so popular was everybody understood it right away, right? People have an obsession with abs. People think that if you have a flat stomach, you're fit. It's just the way that it goes. That product went on to sell over 10 million units and it did a billion dollars in worldwide sales. And that really showed me the power of simple fitness. So while I was running the health club business, Don was out doing the ab roller business, and I was I didn't have a part in that. But an opportunity came along for another piece of exercise equipment, and I was able to jump in headlong. And that that piece of exercise equipment was called the ab coaster. And what it was was a, as an ab machine again that worked from the bottom up. So it was really the first ab machine that worked from the bottom. Everything was a crunch machine, but you know most exercise professionals will tell you that the gold standard in core training is the hanging leg raise, where you would hang from a bar and raise your knees. But most people can't do that exercise because it takes tremendous upper body strength. 
Well, the reason it's so effective is that you don't have a support. You're not lying on the ground, right? You're not lying on a bench. You have to support your core and then move. So it makes it very efficient. So this piece of exercise equipment was exactly that. It eliminated the upper body strength because you supported your arms on, a, on an arm rest. So now you supported your upper body and you were able to move your lower body while having to engage the core. And that product went on to sell over $100 million, still sells to this day. It's our number one selling product. And that really launched the abs company because we were selling it both in those days on TV infomercial and in the health club market. So it gave us that entryway where we were able to attract that home consumer and then also the club professional, the trainers, you know, the coaches and so on and so forth. And it really allowed us to launch our company focusing in that area. That's awesome. And what, um, so it sounds like, yeah, you kind of were at the right spot at the right time with all these um, products and kind of learning under some great people. Um, yeah. so, so tell me what you do for the company um, specifically, maybe some of your functions and responsibilities. So I'm, I'm now the CEO, I'm the owner of the company. So when Don and I started the business back in 07, I was, you know, my technical role was, I was the vice president. So he, there were three partners, me, Don, and a guy named Dave. And Don handled the marketing side, Dave handled the operational side, and I handled the sales side of things. And over time, I started doing all of those things because those guys were stepping out. And the time came for me to be able to buy them out of the business, and that's what happened in 2018. So now as the CEO, my primary function is leadership. You know, I have to run and grow the team and make sure that everything is happening. But, you know, through the years, I had to, as many growing businesses, I was a player coach, right? So when I was doing the sales, I was also trying to lead a sales team. When I was doing the marketing, I was leading a marketing team. And thankfully, as the business continued to grow, I was able to step away and bring in people to truly focus on those areas so I can dedicate my time in my two main areas, which are leadership, of course, as a CEO, I continue to be involved heavily in the product development because, you know, that's something where we really excel. When you look at our product lines, we don't sell what other people sell. We sell what we create or what we license from inventors. So every product is unique. We have 43 worldwide patents on our product. So when you buy from us, you're buying products that you can't get anywhere else. So I'm heavily involved in that because I love it. I love seeing how we can take a simple concept and turn it into something that anybody can use to improve their fitness. Yeah, you know, Sean, I, I had one of those ab rollers back in the day. <laughs> desperately use one today. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I'm looking for the, the the invention that I just wake up one uh, morning and, and I'm, uh, you know, six pack type thing. So when that comes online, let me know. Uh, okay. No, aside from that, you, you know, when you're looking at developing a new product, what, how do you identify a trend in the marketplace and or evaluate, you know, physical condition of a person at this point and make a determination what what would benefit them the most and, and make exercise, you know, easier, if you will, or, or something along those lines? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and, and one that's definitely evolved over time for me. And what it is, you know, in the beginning, when a lot of inventors create products because they think that the product matters. And unfortunately, they fall in love with their products. And every day I receive submissions on our website. We have a portal where if you have an idea, you can submit it to us because a lot of inventors have ideas. They just don't know what to do with them, right? Okay. And that was us too for 20 years, but we figured out what to do with them. Mm -hmm. And we know how to sell products and market them and so on. So we, we see ideas every single day. And unfortunately, I hate to say, but 90% of them just don't have a great place in the market because of one simple reason, which is the answer to your question. You have to find a product that solves a legitimate problem, yeah. right? That's it. If you can solve a real problem for people, not one that you think is a problem, but one that actually exists in the marketplace, sales is easy at that point, right? Yeah. Because you just create the right solution for people. So that's what we look at. When I see these ideas come in or when I have an idea myself, I say, okay, what problem does this solve? because I need to be able to explain it to somebody in a marketing message, very simply, problem, solution, right? Empathy, authority. I can empathize with your problem. Here's why this is the solution. And I'll give you an example. One of the areas in fitness that became very popular over the last five years or so is this idea of functional fitness, right? High intensity interval training, mm -hmm. movement that's, that's supposedly mimic everyday life, right? Whether they do or they don't, 
it's a hot fitness concept right now. Mm -hmm. So we, there was a movement away from just a traditional strength machine to doing things that involved your total body and so on. So one of the exercises that got really popular was flipping these big tractor tires, right? Yeah, right. You did it at CrossFits and at gyms yeah. everywhere and so on. And it is a great exercise because it's total body, right? Mm -hmm. But it's fraught with problems. First and foremost, you need a ton of space to do it, right? Yeah. And secondly, just to be simplistic, there's a safety problem, right? If I'm flipping that tire and it gets away from me, it can land on somebody else. And that's, that's obviously not good. So mm. I was training in a gym here in New Jersey, and they had one of these tires. So I flipped it down the turf, right? I get to the end, I'm like, oh, man, that was hard, but that was great. So I turn around to go back, and somebody was stretching in the turf where I was doing it. I was like, man, I just got my momentum. I'm feeling good. And now I have to stop. And it hit me immediately. What if it didn't move? Problem, solution, right? Great exercise, real problems. How can I solve it? So we figured out how to cut that tire in half, put it on a hinge. Now we can flip it right in place. So now in an area of five feet, I can do all the exercises that I used to need 15, 20 yards of space to do and interrupt right. everybody in the gym for one person exercise. So when wow. we launched that product, it resonated immediately with health club owners and fitness facilities because they recognized the problem. So when we look at a product, that's the first question I ask. Do, can I immediately identify the problem that this is solving? If you need to explain it to me, it's not going to work because in a health club or in a fitness facility, there's not always someone there to explain it to you. Right. Yeah. You have to be drawn to it and say, yeah. I got it. Now, don't get me wrong. When you see my tire flip or many other great inventions. The number one exercise is obvious. Right. OK, understand. That's what makes it work. And then I can show you 29 other things we can do with it that make it even better. So that's what we look for. Does it solve an immediate problem? And is it so intuitive that anybody would understand very little instruction? Because that's what makes products work. Uh, no, that's that's a fantastic explanation. I'm curious, though, you know, when when you create a new product and, and it's, it's a, a motion as simple as flipping the tire. And, and you just stipulated that we've identified 29 other exercises associated with that. How do you, how does that materialize? I mean, who do you bring in outside consultants, you yourself and in, in your, your team or partnerships uh, solve that problem? I mean, that has got to take probably a lot of, of, of outside influence or knowledge about what can you do. Uh, that yeah, no. certain muscle groups and, you know, build strength and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, great, great question. I, you know, I've been doing this a long time, right? And I have degrees and I was an athlete and all that. So I had an eye for it myself, right? Okay. But what I've learned over the years, right? And when I say 29, that was just a made up number, right? You can do hundreds of things. And, and here's, oh, how, fair, fair. here's how it evolves, right? But here's how it evolves from one to 29 to 104, yeah. is you do put trainers on it, right? You bring it to a trade show and okay. you watch, right? You just stand back and you watch. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes people do some cockamamie things. They're like, whoa, don't do that because that's dangerous. <laughs> like, I've seen people try to do handstands on it. It's like, no, 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 no. Let's not do that. But you just watch the sequences that people come up with because trainers and fitness professionals, they can be so creative in it. But again, we have to come up with that initial time. Here's what it does. And then the also comes from us, my team, outside trainers. And I tell you all the time, if you, if you go on any social media and you look up our products, right? Look up Tire Flip 180, which this one's called, or Ab Coaster. You'll see people doing all sorts of amazing routines on it. And that's what's so great about the world we live in today where it's free, right? They're giving it to me saying, look, look at all this stuff. And a lot of times we'll call them up and say, hey, wow, that was incredible. Would you like to do a video for us or write a white paper, whatever it is. So there's so many great ideas out there. But that comes along with, like I was saying earlier, it comes with the humility of growth. Yeah. In the beginning, when you're creating products, you think, and like I see these inventors now, they think because they thought of it, it's the greatest idea, right? Yeah. And then they think that even when they get past that stage, that they've figured it all out. And I say, man, just open your mind and you will take this to levels you've never dreamed of because collectively the group is smarter always. Agreed. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm a huge proponent of that. So you know, going back to something you said a, a moment ago about your uh, you know, movement throughout your career from different positions and roles and marketing or sales or leadership functions, what's been your most interesting and, and, and favorite role to be in? Or is yeah. it you know, being a leader today? 
today today it's leadership, right? Because I I recognize that you know years ago, and I recognize it too late in my career, not too late in my career, but later than I should have, I should say, right? That all problems are leadership problems, and if I can solve for that, the rest starts to take care of itself. But again, let me come back to this word one more time. Leadership requires humility, right? When you're the CEO, when you're the founder of the business, a lot of times people think that means you're the boss, right? You have all the ideas and all this. And yes, you have to ultimately make the decision. The buck has to stop with you at some point, right? Because your neck is on the line. But you have to have the humility to let the team function. And that's leadership, right? Because they have great ideas. And if you create an environment where they will bring those forward, amazing things happen. I've just seen that time and time again. But as a younger you know, entrepreneur and as a younger CEO, I didn't always understand that, right? I yeah. thought people were looking to me to solve everything. I had to grow into that for sure. But I, I loved in the beginning, remember I said there were three of us in the beginning, I was the sales guy and I loved sales. And now a lot of people think like, oh, sales is a bad word, right? I didn't take a single sales course at, at UF. I wish I did. I wish there was more of that offer because everything in life is sales. Sales is nothing more than influence, right? I have to be able to have influence in any relationship that I have, and now a mutual influence, right? And people think that that means that I'm pushing my agenda on you, or I'm tricking you, or I'm swindling you. No, I'm again, I'm solving your problem in here. And once I do that, yeah, there's going to be an exchange. You're going to get my solution for your currency, right? And that's yeah. very fair. People will pay for solutions every day. And I love that puzzle, right? How do I do that? How do I understand? sales? How do I understand and relate to people? Because I love people, man. I'm a people person when it comes down to the end of the day. And I'm not saying I'm the most social guy. Like you put me in the room, I'm that guy running around. But I love a good conversation with somebody. And I love forming that relationship and seeing where those things can go. And that's sales to me. So I, I always love that. But I realized, you know, as I was going through my career that I could not, I could, I had a decision to make, right? I could remain the sales guy, right? Mm. Nothing wrong with that. I loved it. Or I could become the leader and bring in someone to handle that sales function. And I was fortunate that I had one of my college roommates from undergrad um, was just a natural born salesperson. And I brought him into the business when I bought it and I gave him some equity. And now he runs our sales because I'm good at it. He's great at it. He is that guy you could put in a room knowing nobody, everybody be his best friend by the end. And that's what you want. He creates these amazing relationships. So that, that was kind of the, the thing that I loved in the transition. But now as I move on in my career too, I love marketing. You know, I yep. love, and that's such a challenge because the world is very noisy. You know, mm. back in the day, you know, when we were starting out 07, 08, there was, you know, there was your TV, there were commercials, radio, this and that. Now it's everywhere, right? Yeah. People are bombarded with messages. How do I make mine stand out? And again, that's a puzzle for me. I love that sort of thing. So, you know, I let Mike as the guy, and I let him handle a lot of the sales. And again, we, we, we kick it around and figure out the strategies and all that. But I love working with our marketing team to say, what's the message that's going to get across? And most importantly, how do you simplify it? Because they, marketing people tend to complicate things. And I'm a simple guy. You got to explain things to me in very simple terms. And I believe that resonates. No, I, I, I absolutely agree. Simple is, is better uh, at the end of the day. Speaking of relationships, by the way, uh, Dan Connaughton, Dr. Dan Connaughton says uh, hello to you. He yeah. me finally and asked me that I uh, reach out and say hi. So uh, a great, uh, a great friend and mentor. He yeah. he was the guy I worked for when I was at Living Well. They really showed me the ropes and okay. showed me so many things over there about, you know, not only running that, but what was it like to operate within a university system and how did he balance teaching with all that? And, you know, we stayed in touch. Like I left there in 1998, I left. So, you know, 20 years, we're still, still kicking it around. Sometimes I saw him when I visited campus with my son who was, who was touring campus just last year. It was just great to see him. So good people. Good. Excellent person. Yeah, definitely. So great. Cool. Yeah, I have a quick question for you going back to kind of the whole marketing and um, space. Just curious. I mean, how have you managed with the, I feel like fitness, health, hit CrossFit. I mean, there's a lot of trends that go into the industry that you work in. And so how do you um, kind of keep to who true to who you are um, in the process while you see other things kind of ebb and flow? Yeah, we, we look for those trends, right? So we say, okay, what are the trends and what's being done and what's not being done right now? Because what you find in our industry, right, the, the fitness equipment industry, everybody chases. Somebody does it, everybody does it. There's, I hate to say it, but there's not a whole lot of innovation. 
if you go to the big manufacturers in ours, you know, without naming them, everybody knows who they are, they all have the same things, different iteration of the same things. And sometimes that's okay, right? Because you tweak a little bit, so on and so forth. But we look categorically and say, okay, what isn't being done that, again, would solve a problem? So we have three main categories that we focus on. Number one, first and foremost, as is the name of our company, it's ABS. ABS is never going away. <laughs> and what's interesting about that is with the pandemic that came about, our home, home fitness exploded again. And it's not new, right? It's not a new phenomenon, but it exploded because clubs were locked down in many areas of the world, right? So our ab coaster, the home ab coaster, which we launched on television in 2008, we relaunched on television. We've sold it all this time. We wow. put it back on TV in 2020, and it was selling numbers similar to what it was in 2008. It just shows you that that simple thing that maybe, okay, people are going to beat us up and say, well, that's not a fitness plan. Now, we give you a meal plan. We give you cardio. We give you all that. But we know most people take that and put it over here. They're going to use the ab coaster. But if that's the thing that got people moving, that is amazing. So abs will always be an area that we focus on because I'm not interested in making the fit fitter as my primary business. I'm interested in showing the world the benefits of fitness, and that may be the entry point. So that's number one. Number two is hit, like we mentioned, right? So we looked at what were the trends? What are people doing? How can we solve that, right? So we have the tire flip. Another very popular exercise in hit is pushing those sleds. Like you see the athletes mm -hmm. push the big same problems as the tire, right? You need yeah, space. Thanks. It's not always safe, so on and so forth. So we created one that's up on a, on a treadmill deck. So now with the push of a button, I can go from zero to 450 pounds of magnetic resistance. Right. I can push, I can pull, it's bi-directional, so on and so forth. So we looked at that. Nobody was doing that, right? They're all trying to figure out how do I make a better sled, but they never solved the problem of how do you make it safe and how do you eliminate the need for space? And then our third product in that category Another very popular, you see people using those big battle ropes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the problem? They're 30 to 40 feet long. And we weighted one and made it 10 feet long, right? Immediately resonated with the marketplace because they understood the problem. Do you like doing this exercise but don't have the space? Yes, we have a solution. Oh, that's interesting, right? So simple. We put six pound weights in the handles. That was it, but it worked. Yeah. And then our third category, which is a huge, I think right now, the biggest trend in fitness is the glute, the glute category, the booty category. Okay. It, it just turn on any social, right? Every female and even a lot of athletes are focusing in on that because of power mm -hmm. and all those other things. It is so big right now. But if I ask you, what's the number one glute exercise right now? Most people tell you the hip thrust, right? They lay on their back and the hip thrust. Not a new exercise. That's been around forever. But mm -hmm. a few years ago, somebody mechanized it. They made a plate loaded version, a pin loaded version. They're selling everywhere. So we looked at that and said, okay, that's cool, but everybody's doing it, right? What else could you do? And we, so we came up with a product that we call the glute coaster. So we took the rails of our ab coaster, same curve, and now you stand and you press down and back in one motion, which is more functional because that's how your body works. Your body doesn't work by laying on the ground, jamming your hips up in the air to get groceries, right? You do that, but you move every day. You're stepping back, and that's really what we're after. But there's a vanity play there too, and there's a modesty play in our machine, right? Because a lot of the women don't want to lay on the ground and put their hips up in the air for everybody to see. So ours, we can put it right against the wall. Now they can stand and they're just pushing their leg backwards. So that's what we look for. We look for what are the trends that are hot. Social media will tell you that all day long. How do we be different in that category? And that's the winning formula. Yeah, that's awesome. That makes a lot of sense. I was also a collegiate athlete and um, can say I've been in many gyms even ever since. And it is interesting to how um, people work around different machines and you know the sled is huge the, all those things you mentioned and i did see on your website the tire i did think that was quite creative just because mm -hmm. there isn't much space and i'm sure there's a lot of gyms too who uh, i think on the crossfit i've noticed it the most where there's not they don't have huge gyms they use a lot of outdoor space they use a lot of you know random buildings and so i'm sure your products come come in use in those places as well which makes it more accessible to a lot more people uh, they do. And you know, what's interesting about that is if you went to like down to the performance center on campus there, right? And you show you work with the coaches, the coaches may say, well, great idea, but it doesn't get high enough so that I can get a full thrust, which they try to mimic. Completely understood that point. 
But those are what I call the one percenters, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going for them. We mm -hmm. say, I don't know if I can use this word, but we say we go for the masses, not the asses. Yes. <laughs> I want the masses, not the nerd who's going to tell me every little thing that this doesn't do because there's a lot more in the masses, and that's who we are focused on. The guy who really wants that full motion, all that, he's going to find the room for it, and he's going to go to the junkyard and get a tractor. Love it, man. Go do your thing. Mm -hmm. But we're going the other way with it, and that, that's how we thrive, and, and that's how we maneuver the ecosystem. That's great. And so tell me a little bit about the activities you've done. You have um, quite the career in product creation, and then you went from you know sales to kind of leading and CEO. So what have you really enjoyed the most and found the most interesting in, in your roles throughout the years? And then maybe what has really challenged you? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're kind of both the same thing. I would say that I, I loved, you know, again, I love the sales and marketing product development. I still have my hand in all those things. But leadership is really where it's at. You know, as I as I grow into my career, it's my obsession. You know, I read every leadership book. I, I listen to every leadership podcast. I'm doing everything I can do to become a better leader because I find, A, not only does that give my team the autonomy that they seek in their work, but it gives me the freedom to be creative because if I'm not in there every day trying to do every little thing, my mind is clear. Right now, don't get me wrong. I don't micromanage people, but I micromanage results. We are a results driven business and we have to win. There is no money tree out in the back of my office. We don't take funding from anybody. We are a private company. We must succeed. Pandemic, no pandemic. We have to do it. And that's my job. I have to make sure that we do that, but I have to let my team do the work. Right. And again, I really had to grow into that through the years. And now, as I said, it's my obsession. I try every day to become a better leader somehow. And I also have now, I have a leadership team and we meet every week, every Monday morning, eight o'clock, I have them on the phone. I want it before the week starts, we kick it off. That's how we do it. And we go through everything, our metrics, blah, blah, blah. But I'm also teaching them about leadership because one of my primary roles is to grow more leaders. Because as the business grows, you need more leaders on the team. And, and that's really the game. We have four core values here at our company. It's gratitude, leadership, big things and win. So gratitude is our spirit. If you're around us, you're going to feel a sense of gratitude. We're just so grateful to have these opportunities and to be in this game. Leadership is how we act. And that's so critical because I teach everybody on the team. If you're on this team, you are a leader. I don't care if you don't have a leadership position, but you must act as a leader because someday you will have a leadership position here. Mm -hmm. Big things is our mindset. We don't think small here. We don't look for the excuses. We don't We don't tolerate any of that. We're looking, where can we go, man? Always eyes down the field for us. And win is what we do here. So my job every day is to continue to instill those four values across our company with our customers, with our vendors, with our team and everything. And that's what I really love to do. But it also is the most challenging thing that I've ever done in my career, right? So sales, I get it. I'm, I'm getting more no's and yeses like anybody would. It's just a numbers game, right? That's it. My marketing messages, sure. Some work, some don't. Products, I have developed a lot of products that don't work, right? I'll tell you about the four or five that did. I couldn't even tell you how many didn't. But that's the game, right? But all of those things, you move on, right? Leadership is a challenge because every day, over the course of my career, I've employed hundreds of people. And just think about all the different personalities that that involves and all the desires and what they want. I, I equated sometimes to like, got all these kids pulling out, I want this and I need that and, blah, blah. and you have to manage all of that. And as awesome as that is, it's definitely the most challenging because human capital is, is very draining sometimes, you know? And it, but it's, a, it's something that I wouldn't do away with. I'm not a rise of the robots guy. Let me replace people with computers. And of course I get that, why that's important too but I love people. And so I embrace that challenge. That's incredible. So going back to something you said earlier, you talked about uh, home gyms, you know, spiking obviously and exercise yeah. because most of the, the gyms have closed in some capacity as a result of COVID. How has that impacted your business? I mean, have you been able to just from the rebound, if you will, in home exercise, overcome it or is there you know any you know, hope on the horizon if you will with respect to gyms opening back up and kind of transitioning to you know attract people back uh what are, what are your thoughts in, in regards to that 
Yeah, I mean, great and relevant question. So it's one's very hotly debated in our industry, right? There's the doomsday people who say, gyms are gone forever. And I'm like, no, Rick, they're not. They're coming back. And I'll tell you why. We're social. We're social people, right? And I don't care what you're doing at home. I have a Peloton at home. I love it. I have a Woodway treadmill at home. I have a home gym, right? I love that. Some mornings I don't want to go to the gym. I just want to roll downstairs and do my thing. I work out at 5 a.m. every morning. New Jersey, it's freaking cold, man. So some days I don't want to go out. I'll just go down in the basement and do my thing. Right. But as soon as my gym reopens, right, I have a beautiful YMCA about a mile from my home. As soon as that reopened, I was first in line because I missed my friends over there. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a crew of people, 5 a.m., and it's the same people showing up for years over there. I miss them. And I'm not the guy who runs around talking to everybody because I want to train, but I'm, hey, what's up, man? Knuckles, or whatever it is, I love that. And that's why gyms are coming back. You can't replicate that with home. Mm -hmm. As much as Peloton, right, and group things like that give you a sense, right? There's no real inter. There's no give and take there. I can high five you, do whatever the heck you do, but it's not real. So gyms are coming back. And here's the thing: there's always been home fitness, right? There's yeah. always been clubs, right? You heard of uh, Jack Elaine. You heard of Jane Fonda, yeah. right? Those those people were were pitching exercise tapes and workout at home forever. There's a beautiful harmony there because people who train at home at some point say, you know what? I want a little bit more for my fitness, or I want that human interaction. What do I do? I'm going to go, I'll try out the club, right? That's why there's so many types of clubs, right? There's health clubs and there's CrossFit studios and there's spin studios, and there's yoga studios, there's all those types because people don't just want to do that at home. Now, did it explode in the past year again? Like, did it bubble up? Yeah, I'm a continuum guy, right? So I always say, right, the, the pendulum swung way over here, yeah. but it's coming back. So when you ask, like, how did we manage it? We were fortunate in the sense that we've always done both. Right. And we were when we started, we were more on the home side. I would say we were probably 70, 30 home to commercial through the years. We swung the other way. Right. My commercial business became a lot bigger because I had more products offered to the clubs than I did to the home. Mm. But being having our foot in both worlds, when this happened, it was able to swing back a little bit. Now, you can't make up a lot of what you're losing in club business to the home just because the price points are so different. Yeah. A product for the club, maybe two thousand. A home maybe 300 right so theoretically you can sell a lot more but it's hard right so we want we want both and the other thing the last thing i'll say about that is that the um the world didn't all shut down right there were many states i was just in Florida last week i was down at the super bowl and we worked out at a club down in, <laughs> in Tampa. and this was funny i come in with my mask on right and i check in so i asked the young lady behind the desk i said okay so what's the rule on with cardio and no weights. She goes, no, no, once you get behind the desk, you can take it off. I'm like, oh, I needed to check in, but not over there. Got it. The clubs, with the clubs down there, it was packed. And I loved seeing it, right? I loved seeing people keep that focus on their fitness. Because I think the blessing out of all of this is that health was brought right back to the top of our list again. Because we realized once again how fragile it is. I, I say all the time, you ever go to a funeral and people are like, oh, life is so short. Why does it take a funeral for that to, to be the thing? We know it's short, right? We know how, how important health is. This magnified it now. So I think our industry is poised for explosion in all areas because once the world opens back up, as it is doing already, New Jersey, we can be back in clubs now and a lot of places around the country, we can be doing that. And we're seeing people open new clubs, which I love seeing, right? They're not just making, they're opening. And the customers we have are saying that this January, their check-ins and their signups were on par or better than last January pre-pandemic because it's magnified again. People are realizing, shoot, I can't necessarily control whether I get the COVID or not. But if I'm healthier going into it or whatever the next thing is, I'm better for it. Hands down, undeniable. Okay. No, that's a great response. I appreciate that insight. So there's been a lot of debate, obviously, and uh, it's, it's nice to hear someone from the industry inside uh, to provide some, you know, scope uh, with respect to what the expectations are and and uh, potential, you know, increases uh, on the horizon. So that's awesome. Uh, yeah, the last thing I'll say about that real quick is I think that when, when people talk about these things, they talk their book, you know? So like okay. when I hear people like, oh, they're never coming back. So what does this guy do? Oh, he's a digital guy. Gotcha. Right. Gotcha. Or, oh, uh, yeah, they're all coming back. Well, is this guy? Well, he doesn't have a home solution. Right. So you got to yeah. just look at it objectively and and get out of your little pocket. Again, we we do business in in over 50 countries around the world. We see it all. I see what's going on out there. And again, some are complete lockdowns still. Don't get me wrong. Right. Some are 
they're locked. Others wide open, like nothing yeah. ever happened. So it, it'll be fine. I, I agree. In the end, yeah. A lot of things I think people have said that would go away forever. I, I just – we're social beings. It's just an impossibility in some aspects that it won't bounce back and bounce back, I think, better than ever. Uh, so I, I, I tend to agree with you in that regards. So, you know, in your career, you know, I'm sure you've had some setbacks along the way. Have you ever looked back on any of them and, and said that, you know, oh, that was a huge blow, but it was to my advantage later on in my career? Nope. Never. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely. love that. <laughs> you know, we, one of the things we say around here is fail forward, right? Fail okay. forward. I mean, make new mistakes. Here. I've made every mistake you could make, right? That's why one of the things I enjoy doing is speaking with new entrepreneurs, people just starting, because I can accelerate your game 15 years by telling you what not to do, right? Because yeah. I've done it. I've blown so much money on things that I thought were going to work. I've wasted so much time on things I thought were going to work. But that's the game, right? And I'm still here. It's, I'm, I'm still I'm looking for that next thing. I am not afraid to fail. And that's one of the things that I think the generation coming up had better wrap their head around. Everybody thinks that they have to be perfect. Everybody thinks that you have to get it right the first time. You're 18 years old. You're not supposed to know all the answers. But social media will show you everybody's smarter, richer, better than you are, right? No, yeah. none of those people are making any mistakes. It's all nonsense, right? Talk to anybody who's actually been in the game, right? In this game, as long as I have, 20 years, they will tell you every mistake they've made. When you get around a true circle of entrepreneurs, right, which I like to surround myself with, people much better than I am, you know you are in the right room when they are telling you about their mistakes, not their victories. We all see when you drove up in the rolls, we know you got some victories over there. Tell me what you screwed up over there. Yeah. Are you humble yeah. enough to do that, right? So like I said, I have had several products through the years that we thought were going to be that next big thing because I, I ran it through my model, right? And I said, okay, here's a problem. Here's what they're not doing. Is it simple? Is it intuitive? Yep. Check, 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 check. Bring it to the trade show right? Which was our proving ground for many years, right? And those will be back to it. Yeah, totally. And it just falls flat on its face. And people are like, again, if I have to stand there and explain it to you, it's never going to work because in the club, that's not going to happen, right? So I can't tell you how many products I've had that's happened to. I can't tell you how much money I've spent on Google ads and Facebook ads and all this. It just went right in the trash because it wasn't the right message, right? But as I say, you never trip on something that's behind you. When you fail, you learn from, you take a look back and say, okay, what can I learn from that experience? And now I'm a big believer, you have to protect the downside, right? I'll never go to something that if I made this mistake, my company's gone because there's a lot of people counting on me every single day and I won't let that happen. But am I afraid to go two steps backward? Nope, not at all, right? It's no problem. And that's the biggest thing I hope people understand is you are going to fail. I don't care who you are, right? And I don't care what you do, you are going to fail, you know? Go down and watch the Super Bowl, right? I was, I was there last week. I was at the game. You're watching these guys play, right? You think every play went for positive yards? It didn't, right? They went, and I, I say it's like the it's like the red zone, right? They get in there. Let's say you're you're first and and you're first and goal, right? You're on the five yard line. You think, wow, we got this. And that was me with a lot of these products. I was on the five yard line. I'm like, here we go. We're cashing this one in. First play, I hand it off, stuffed at the line. Okay, let's go again, right? Second one, we roll out, right? Get dropped for a five-yard loss. Shoot, we just went backwards in that. What am I going to do now? Cry about it? No, I'm coming up to the line again on third down. I'm going to run a play action. I'm going to get that touchdown. That's business too, right? Yeah. It's the same sort of thing. If you dwell on all the mistakes you made because you're going to make them, you're never going to get anywhere. So that's my opinion on that is don't be afraid to fail. Learn from those things, but forget them quickly. Move forward. I think that's a great metaphor uh, for life in general, just getting back up after you get knocked down and, and, and starting again. So yeah. uh, and I think the most successful I, I've owned businesses and well uh, in the past and I've been bankrupt, uh, you know, all sorts of messes that I've gotten myself into. And uh, you just got to pick yourself back up and one foot at a time and uh, and see where it takes you. Uh, and it, uh, I arrived here uh, after all. So. Uh, things work out uh, if, you, if you know where I'm coming from. So, yeah. I have a good friend of mine who owns over 125 clubs in Asia. Wow. And um, he's an American guy. And he went over there to start his business because, you know, like we look for that green pasture. He looked for it in the club world. 
yeah. over there blew it up, man. He was the guy I was with the Super Bowl with. And he has a saying, he says, no choice. Those are two words, no choice, right? So when that happens, okay, you failed, you went bankrupt, you did this, da 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 No choice, man. You got to keep going because the alternative is, what do you, well, there is no alternative unless you're going to give up, cash in the chips right then and have a, you know, give, throw away the rest of your life. It's not worth it, man. It's just, yeah. it's just stuff. It's just money. It's just time. You got yeah. more, go get it. I agree. Sometimes that's hard, though. You, you get to a point in your life, you're like, whoa, I'm doing okay. Let me stop. And then uh you're you're afraid to make those next you know vital moves uh because you don't want to lose what you've established and and i I like what you said about sometimes you got to go backwards uh in order to make uh forward progress uh so that's perfect look look at tom brady right Mm -hmm. now i i'm not a bucks fan right i wasn't a patriot fan but i'm a tom brady fan because the guy's a winner and what did he teach you right so the guy in the league 20 years 10 super bowls seven wins five MVPs. Why does he get up and do that again? Because he wants to be that best version of himself. He could be the guy that you just said, right? He accomplished enough. Walk away. Yeah. But that I believe that people want to be the best version of themselves. That's why the most successful keep going. It's not about more stuff. It's not about more anything. It's about being the best version of, of him. The guy's 43 years old. He's got a lot yeah. of time left in his life. What's he going to do next, right? And same with all of us. It's, yeah, it's enticing sometimes. You hit a certain level of success, like, oh, I made it, right? But being yeah. the best version of yourself, there's no finish line to that. You yeah. have to keep moving forward. In that. And that's the fun of it to me, right? And that's what I hope the young people who are coming up now realize, well, there's no finish line. Just keep going forward. The, the opportunities that are going to present in their lifetime yeah. is mind-boggling. I look at how fast the world changed in the 20 years since I left UF. Can you imagine? It's accelerating. Now. It's I'm accelerating. Go, oh, yeah. Imagine the opportunities that will be there in 20 years for these kids. I have little kids. I, I, I'm mind boggled the, the, the things that they will see. And they'll be explaining to me someday. Hey, dad, this is how this works, right? It's be crazy. So just keep moving, man. Keep Agreed. Moving. I love it. That's such a good thing for our students to hear on both sides, whether it's like major success or it's major failure that you're continuing to move forward. Um, I think, you know, some of our students have been discouraged, obviously, with the COVID pandemic and then concern about jobs and the industry is different and all those things. But again, like you said, even when we fail or when things aren't exactly like we thought, like we just keep moving forward and we make the best choice we can um, and keep and keep going. Don't quit and don't be discouraged um, where you just go, I can't do this. I'm going to pivot everything I've dreamed of because I, it doesn't look the way I thought it was going to. So I think that's always really good to reinforce for our, our students today. It's important because who would have predicted, right? Last January, January, 2020, I was in China. Okay. That's where we make our stuff. And I was there just when you were starting to hear the rumblings of this. And I remember thinking, I said, it wasn't, they didn't talk about it as much here. We're talking about it over there. And I remember thinking to myself, what if this happens in health club? Oh my gosh. They're going to shut down health clubs, right? I'm like, oh, what are we going to do, right? And then it happened, right? Nobody could have ever predicted that this was going to happen. I get some conspiracy people said they knew, but whatever, right? In general, <laughs> most people could not have predicted what the last seven, eight months were going to be. I got so many calls as this was happening. Are you okay? What's going to happen? You sell to health clubs. Health clubs are closed. I'm like, I don't know, Paul. I'll figure it out, right? <laughs> because that's what we do. We figure things out because... There's no alternative to that. Right. Like I said, there's a lot of people counting on me out here. And the first thing I did, I gathered my team together before we all went remote, you know, because we, we did that for comfort. I come to the office every day, just get me out of the house and nobody's here so I can do this, right? The first thing I did, I brought in my brother. My brother's a colonel in the army and he's been to real war. And I had him talk about wartime leadership and what that takes because understanding that you're not going to be able to control everything that is about to come at you is critical, but you have to focus on what you can control. And so in our business, what could we control? Well, we know this home thing is coming. Let's get more inventory. Let's shift our marketing message. We know that certain states never really shut down. Certain countries didn't shut down. So, hey, salespeople, let's focus on those areas. Let's find that way. Because if I, as the leader, started to panic and been like, oh, no, what are we going to do? And I'm not saying I never had those thoughts, but I never said that to them for sure, right? <laughs> I have to portray that confidence in there to keep moving forward because you're absolutely right. The students who are coming through now who have invested all this money in a degree. They're about to graduate. They thought they were going to do X. 
Now they might have to do Y, but that's a great thing for them because they're going to learn a new skill that they didn't think they needed to have. They were going to go work in a facility and they were ready for that. Great. But all those facilities are going to have a digital component right now. Could you get in front of a camera and do that same thing that you were doing in person? Now teach it, right? Could that parlay into a business of your own that's doing that? The opportunities are mind boggling because in crisis times, that's where new opportunities present themselves. You have to be ready for that. So if your students are looking like, oh, I thought I was going to do this and they don't know how to handle that change, forget COVID. This will be over at some point, right? But there's going to be Schmovid and Bovid and Tovid. There's going to be something else mm -hmm. every year. So that's what I say to my team is two things. Number one, never wish away a second of your life ever because, oh, I wish this was over. How many people said, oh, I can't wait till 2020 is over. Oh, the year we want to forget. That's nonsense. Don't ever forget the year of your life. It's a blessing to have a year in your life. So embrace it. And number two, I don't know what it is, but something else is coming. That's it. That's life. So you better be prepared for that. And you better know how to adapt and overcome because that's how the only way you're going to win in life. It's just not that simple where I'm on my path and I'm going to stay there, right? Yeah. This isn't 1945 when things were a lot simpler, right? And we were just able to move like this. Now it's coming at us from all sides. We have to be willing to adapt. And students have to learn that. And I, the, the wise ones are embracing that. Yeah, there's always adversity. That's always. both in sport, on the field, off the field, a life. Like, that's just, that's reality. So, that's right. for sure. So, um, Sean, speaking a little bit to your... You know, how do you balance? I think I feel like with the entrepreneurial spirit, there's that like there's always probably ideas um, from what I take and, and lots going on and being a CEO. So how do you maintain work life balance? Is that possible um, being the CEO of a company um, and even in, in product creation and things like that? Yeah, I, I mean, look, anything's possible. I don't believe in that concept, right? I don't believe in work-life balance. I don't because I think you'll try to make yourself crazy. Like, OK, I need to be here and I need to be there and da, da, da. Here's what I believe in. Here's what I think the secret is. It's presence. As my good, one of my good friends, one of my mentors owns a business much bigger than mine as well. We coached football together. I was a, our kids grew up. My oldest son is now 18. And from the time he was kindergarten to high school, I coached the football team. And this guy coached with me. Great friend, great mentor, entrepreneur, all those things. He said one thing to me and he would say it to the kids all the time too. Be where your feet are. Be where your feet are. That's the key it all. You're never going to strike the right balance. Okay. Oh, I worked 55 hours this week. So now I need to do 13 at home. That's not life, right. You just don't know. And I don't care if you're a CEO or you're the, you know, entry level person in the job. Sometimes stuff's going to happen and you're going to need to work a little more than you should have or so on and so forth. But when you are at work, be at work. Don't be on the, the socials and don't be texting your friends all day. Work, right. Bring real value to the company that is paying you. That's how you excel in it. When you are home with your family, and now again, a lot of college students don't have families yet, but they will someday probably, right? They may have a spouse, they may have kids or whatever. Whatever that is, when you are there, be there with it. Don't be playing with your kids and yet checking a work email real quick. You know, And we all slip in those areas. I have an 18 year old, I have a two year old and I have a four year old. And when I'm playing with the little ones, if I pick up that phone, they know already, like, be working, right? Boom, snap me right back, put that thing down, right? Because I know I have to be present there. When you're with your spouse, your significant other, if you're going out to a dinner or whatever, you're at the dinner table, talk, man, connect, do those things, because that time is precious. This isn't going anywhere. As you know, you can be a CEO or whatever the hell we want to call ourselves. It's not going. It's all these problems that I wake up to and go to sleep to every night always going to be there. So just be where your feet are. That's the key to it for me, for sure. Because you can never replace the time. You can never replace those moments. Having fathered a, a, a now college student, right, from the past 18 years, I, I thought old people used to say, oh, it goes so fast. Thank <laughs> God. He's an old guy talking. But I can tell you, man, it just goes fast. And yeah. you want to cherish those memories, for sure. There's not an email that I, I wish I answered when I was supposed to be watching the baseball game with my son. I can tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and then just talking a little bit about to the students, do you have any advice for students interested in pursuing a career in exercise science and maybe the product creation similar to yours? Don't do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I do. I, I do. And this is another topic that I'm really passionate about because it comes up all the time, right? Especially in today's world. 
should you do what you're good at? Should you do what you love? Should you do where you can make the most money, right? Those are the things. And again, I think the idea of success nowadays is very sensationalized. Again, I'll go back to social media and maybe I'm the old guy blaming social media. <laughs> don't get me wrong, I'm on all the socials too, right? My business is on there, I'm on the person. I love that stuff. But I can see through a lot of what young people can't see through because I've seen the realities, right? And if you think that the way to have a happy and fulfilled life is by chasing things, you are severely mistaken, right? And you will end up with a life where maybe you had some success, but you didn't have true fulfillment. And that's the ultimate failure. It just is because you're not going to be happy at that point. So then it comes down to should you do what you're good at or should you do what you love? You have to do what you love. That's what the students need to understand. If there's an area in fitness that they love, maybe it's training people to be better ping pong players, whatever, and they can become the world's foremost expert in that because they are so passionate about the game, they will never want for success a day in their life because they're going to find a way to do it. When I was coming out of school, I had a lot of friends, like a lot of people graduating do, who were in other fields, right? They were engineers. They went into pharmaceutical sales, medical professions. And when I was 22, 23 years old, I would see them making all this money and being what I thought was successful. And here I was, I was a trainer at a gym. And in those days, I was making about $7 an hour. And then I went to UF and I got my master's degree. So now I was big time, right? I had a, a master's in clinical physiology. I was going to come out and make big time money now because I was a big deal. I came back and I was making $26,000 a year. $500 a week is what I made. But I got to be around the guy that set me up for the career that became my life's love and my life's work because I followed what I loved. Now, don't get me wrong. There were days I doubted it. Right. And I was actually interviewing. I said, maybe at this fitness thing, I don't think I can make a living out of this. And I was doubting. And I came back one day and I talked to Don. He said, you know what I want you to do is I want you to go to a fitness convention. I'm like, what's a fitness convention? I'm thinking you're going to go and everybody's going to walk around with a big jug of protein and do burpees and stuff. And <laughs> I didn't know, but I'm like, cool, I'll leave New Jersey for a couple of days. I'll go to this fitness convention. And when I went to the convention, what I found was a group of people that was just like me, people who thought like I thought, people who believed what I believed, and people who just loved fitness. As you got to talk to them, some were my age, some were middle age, some were, had been doing this for 20 or 30 years, the passion in their eyes, the stories of the lives that they changed were so powerful. I knew right then that for the rest of my life, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be in the fitness industry and I am going to change people's lives through fitness. And it has made a beautiful life for me. I could have never have imagined all the opportunities that would have presented to me. I've traveled the world. I've sold hundreds of million dollars for the product. I've employed a lot of people. I've made millionaires out of inventors. I've done things that I could have never imagined, but it's because I stuck with my passion, and that is fitness. So to those students that are out there thinking, should I do this? Did the pandemic change it? So on and so forth. If this is what you love, then this is what you should do. If this is not what you love, maybe you love coffee or maybe you love peanut butter, go do that. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it, man. Shift, pivot, find your thing. Because the reality is the majority of your life is going to be spent doing some type of employment, whether it's for yourself or for somebody else. You're going to be working. We all know that. And when you're doing something that you're so passionate about, that strikes down that whole life balance thing too, life work balance thing, because you don't care. It's just a part of who I am, right? Like I have my three children. I have a wife. I have a business, right? Those are all, they're all part of me. You can't take away any one of those and leave me fulfilled. And that's what I wish for everybody, that you find the thing you're so passionate about that you could not imagine not doing it. That's when you're going to win. Mm. Uh, that's some sound advice there. Uh, I appreciate that. You had said a moment ago that you're on all the social media platforms. And if if you don't mind, if you could let students know uh, which ones they could possibly connect with you uh, on, that'd be awesome. Sure. Yeah, we, we'd love that. They they can find our company. It's at the abs company. So T-H-E-A-B-S company all spelled out on okay. all of them on TikTok, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Perfect. 
all those. Um, and that's our website too, theabscompany.com. Okay. And if any of them want to reach out to me directly as a as a alum, please feel free. It's Sean S E A N as it is on the screen there at theabscompany.com. Just say Gator Show, Gator Student, whatever. I will get back. I'll tell you guys a funny story about that. A lot of people on LinkedIn now use that as one of their hooks, right, to get yeah. at you. Because people yeah. are coming at you the time. Guy, guy hit me up just the other day. Gator to Gator? Question mark. I opened it, right? And then we had a meeting yesterday. We might even do some work together. We'll see. But it's a powerful connection. They should use it. So, um, yeah, anybody wants to reach out anytime, any question, just hit me up. I will get back to you. And, and Sean, I appreciate you affirming that because that Gator to Gator stuff from this office. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, well, I work. We've been work. trying to tell them that it, there's there's weight to this. Mm -hmm. There's clout to emailing from there and, and letting them know. Mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciate you affirming that. Now, we're going to move into another segment that's a lot of fun. Doesn't take a whole lot of time. And uh, Shelly's going to do some rapid fire stop questions with you and uh, and then wrap oh. it up for the day. Okay, so basically how this works is we go for one minute, I put it on a timer, and then I rapid fire questions. Pretty simple. Just answer whatever comes to your mind, and we're going to see how many you can get through um, by the one minute mark. So are you ready? I'm ready. Great. First job. Uh, selling candy. Current hobby. Fitness. LinkedIn or Twitter? LinkedIn. Favorite time of day? 4.40 a.m. when the alarm goes off. Oh, Name two daily habits. Reading and praying. Oh. Netflix, Prime Video, or cable? Oh, man. Uh, Netflix. Netflix. <laughs> Burgers or pizza? Pizza. Favorite animal? Dog. Mountains or beaches? Beaches. Favorite type of food? Italian. What phone app do you waste the most time on? TikTok. <laughs> Interesting. Name, name one pet peeve. People who talk too much. If I looked up your most played songs, what song or artist would I see? Mm. You would see, uh, I would just say hip hop music in general. It's my playlist. Okay. Time. That was it. Thank you so much. That was good. You're good. good. If, if we had more time, Sean, I'd want to know what kind of candy were you selling and where. Yeah, it, I was almost going to ask. I'll tell you real, real quick. I'll tell you real quick. So, cool. you, well, most entrepreneurs, they probably have some candy selling story in their background, right? And that was that was me and my brother. We grew up very, very modest means, you know, whatever. And so we had to find ways. So, we, when we were in high school, we figured out that kids were hungry in school. So, we would go to the supermarket. Each night we'd buy, in those days, you'd buy like a six pack of Milky Way for two bucks. We'd go in the next day and sell them for a dollar each. And so my brother and I would walk around with these big backpacks and everybody knew those are the two guys who sell the candy. Uh, yes. Some teachers put us in detention. Some appreciated what we were doing and, and let us do our thing. So <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. I, I did some door to door sales too, or well, grocery store to grocery store sales back in the day. Uh, so I, I do appreciate where you're coming from. I think every entrepreneur has had some sort of experience like that. But uh, so the skin. It, it should be a college course. It should be. It's like, listen, I was selling uh, Spanish chorizo sausage uh, <laughs> and salted cod uh, back in the day out of a car. Oh, Jesus. Uh, so if, I, if you can sell that, you are an A salesperson. If you ever listen, leave there, come work for me. That's right. <laughs> well, the long God. story, but I did all right with it. So it, it's funny. I was funny, calling a Milky Way. That was easy. <laughs> that's an easy one. Salted cotton wasn't so easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you so much, Sean, for uh, joining us today and taking the time uh, with you, you know, discuss your professional endeavors. So I, I know that the University of Florida Department of Sport Management students, the faculty, the alumni, industry friends and whatnot appreciate and value your thoughts. I, I, I have gained a lot of knowledge. In fact, there's probably four or five things I'm going to go back through the video and and peel off. Uh, your quotes are, are inspirational and intriguing. So thank you. Now, but with, with that being said, do you have anything that you'd like to, like any concluding remarks that you'd like to share? Yeah, I would just like to say, that, uh, hey, first of all, thank you for having me. It was a wonderful opportunity to share some of my experiences. You know, as you move along in your career, that's being able to share what you've learned, it matters. Um, and I will say to the, to the Gator students that are listening, that the University of Florida was a huge part of my life. And it still is. It's something I truly identify with. My friends even make fun of me. Like, you forget where you went to undergrad. You just say you're a Gator. It does. It's so impactful because of the people there. Take advantage of everything that's there. It'll carry you far in life. And like I said, 
find that thing that you love. You'll never want a day in your life. That's a, a great parting message, and we really appreciate that. So thank you again, Sean, for your insight and your time. Uh, we are your host, Brian Avery. And Shelly Lyle. And go, go Gators. Gators, right? Go Gators. <laughs> <laughs>